So I just want to say a few words um, first just about this award. I am enormously honored by this for a lot of reasons. And I, I was actually born in Springfield, Illinois, and I lived in Illinois for the first 10 years of my life. And then I moved off to Portland, Oregon. I grew up on the West Coast. And I just moved back to Chicago a couple months ago. So I actually live here. Yay! <laughs> yeah. Um, and the month that I moved back here was the was it was literally in the process of packing my house to come here when I got the call telling me I'd won this award. It's the first award that I won. Um, the book has since won a couple others, and hopefully maybe we'll win a few more. But um, this was the first one, and it felt like a homecoming on so many levels, uh, both to be coming back here after all these years away and to have um, the book recognized by um, the Chicago Tribune, by the Heartland Prize, and in really embraced by the city. So thank you to everyone. Um, thank you to Liz and the Chicago Tribune. And I just want to say that I think it's so uh, wonderful that this year that the, the Tribune Awards honored two science books. You know, science, in some ways, one of the, yeah, exactly, <laughs> yay. <clears throat> I think, you know, science is so incredibly important to da for daily life. It absolutely affects every single person out there. I think one of the reasons why my book has been so, um, has really touched so many people and has been as widely read as it is, is that there's not a single person in the world who has not personally benefited from Henrietta Lacks's cells. They, you know, anyone who's gotten the polio vaccine, you know, you're, you benefited from Henrietta's cells. Her cells were used to help develop the vaccine. Her cells made some of our most important cancer medications. You know, I, I spend a lot of time traveling and talking at universities, and I, I hear from kids who come up to me and say, you know, my mom, my brother, my mother, or my father had this certain kind of cancer, and the drug that saved my family member was developed using HeLa cells, and I feel like a lot of what the Lacks family went through which you read about in the book, the, the, which in a lot of ways is about what happens when you lose a parent. You know, a lot of people are saying, I didn't have to go through that because of this science that came from this one woman. And so there's a really personal connection, I think, for everyone in this story. And, and I think that's one of the most important things that science writing can do is, I mean, that's true of all science. All science is important to everyone. And it's often very hard for people to make that connection between science and sort of why they should care, why they should care about it. Um, so, you know, when I heard that the Heartland Prize was being awarded to two science books, I just, it absolutely, I was thrilled because of that. I think it's so incredibly important to get science out to the general public and to do it through storytelling, because really that's the way that you show people what science really means and why you should care about it. So I'm absolutely thrilled to be a part of all of this. Um, and. I wanted to actually read, um, read a little quote from one of my absolute favorite science writers who's been an inspiration to me my entire life, and that's um, this guy named E.O. Wilson. Um, <laughs> there's this essay of his that I, you know, I've been teaching science writing for a long time, and every time I teach, I use this essay that he wrote, and I have no idea how long ago he wrote it. I'll, we'll have to ask him, but it's called Life is a Narrative, and it's an essay about the fact that science is actually narrative and that within science there, there are so many stories and that the way that science works is actually is, is a narrative. And so in the conclusion of this essay, he says, science writing, sorry, science writing is bound to grow in influence because it's the best way to bridge to the two cultures in which civilization is still split. Most educated people who are not professionals in the field don't understand science and technology, despite the profound effect these ju juggernauts of modernity have on every aspect of their lives. Symmetrically, most scientists are semi-literate journeymen with respect to the humanities. <laughs> They're thus correspondingly removed from the heart and spirit of our species. How to solve this problem is more than just a puzzle for creative writers. It is the central challenge of education in the 21st century. And I absolutely couldn't agree with that more. And I think, yes. <laughs> and so I, I thank you know, the Heartland Prize for bringing these, those two things together. You know, people often think of science and the humanities of being separate, and they're absolutely not. And I think the, the challenge of science writing is to show that, 
and to show the ways in which they are actually the same. Um, and I'm very excited to be here with E.O. Wilson and to be able to sit and have a conversation about science writing with him. So I'm going to stop talking now so we can get him out here and um, have a conversation. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, uh, I um, will just say a few words of why I ventured forth from the safe confines of a career, a lifelong career in scientific research and nonfiction, to go out into the little known land of stormy weather and circling wolf packs of critics <laughs> uh, and uh, risk, risk all uh, by writing a novel. And I'll just say a few words to that and then perhaps we can engage Elizabeth and Rebecca and I in a conversation of the kind that you may find interesting, particularly on the relationship between science uh, and uh, literature. Uh, why did I write this book? I will try to answer it in a few words, and I may be preempting number one question on, uh, that uh, Elizabeth might have asked me, but I did it first for the challenge. I wondered how it would be uh, to write a novel, and I'm a southerner. I come from Mobile, Alabama, and I, uh, that's, uh, the storytellers come from there. And so I thought I'd like to write a story, and I wondered what it would take. Well, I learned, and it took, among other things, a lot of hard work. But the second reason was that I wanted to uh, introduce nature into a novel, and into a southern novel in particular, uh, where I was on home ground in my background, my childhood and young manhood. I wanted to introduce nature in the form of an ecosystem that would be virtually a character in the novel, described in such detail of, as, an, as a naturalist, as an ecologist might describe it, that you could come to sympathize with it. And indeed, the ecosystem concerned uh, is, was, it has counterparts that are real, uh, a, a tiny remaining fragment of the once great savanna, Longleaf savanna forest that covered 60% of the South and the Carolinas of Texas, and after the Civil War, we cut it all down for the money, down to the last, less than 1% left. And the young man who discovers it and becomes obsessed with its preservation then is a logical character, human character, to enter into the struggle that's to follow between the triangle of forces now operating uh, in the South that are crucial uh, to the fate of our natural environment resources down there on one side are the still reckless and often greedy developers moving quickly to pick up valuable land uh, with little concern about its consequences. On another side, uh, there's a growing force of environmentalists and conservationists gathering in those Gulf states and on the other uh, is the rather bizarre uh, radical far right uh, among a few Christian cults that consider those who are trying to hold on to the uh, natural world and save it as a kind of act of Satan because as one of the characters says, God did not put his son on this earth to save bugs and snakes, he put them on this earth to save souls and anybody else doing, uh, doing anything else must be acting for the Antichrist. Well, these are the forces of, uh, real forces in the South. And uh, so I wanted to develop those themes and in so doing call attention to the South and in fact to parts of the world where valuable ecosystems are disappearing in the midst of similar forces and thus generalize out of it. There was a green message, but I hope that it's subtle and works its way subconsciously and does not harm the narrative interest of this particular work of art. Thank you. Wonderful. 
So, Rebecca, yes. you said that E.O. Wilson is your hero. <laughs> I don't so know if you heard let's that. engage in a little here. Put me at a disadvantage. No, no, no. <laughs> E.O. E. Wilson, yeah. right, so who was your hero? What? Do you, who was your hero? Do you have a hero? I'm sorry, I didn't get it. I've got to turn on my, wait, my hearing aids are already on. Oh. Say it again. <laughs> Do you have a hero? Oh, well, let me just say first about uh, Rebecca, that this is a kind of a remarkable consolation here. This young lady has started on a distinguished career, started on it, and um, uh, at the beginning, her first book, and uh, here I am toward the end of my career, so we're kind of bookends. <laughs> and uh, if I might uh, use that expression, my hero, well, if I ever had a hero in writing, I've got, you know, people I enormously admire in science, uh, but uh, that would bore you if I started telling you why, you know, so-and-so's final solution of the three-dimensional structure <laughs> of tri-bublio mucktase was <laughs> such a thrilling thing to see. I'm not going to do that. Uh, I'll just say what were literary heroes where, who, in my career as a student at the University of Alabama, which did have serious, I mean, faculty seriously interested in literature, uh, would certainly have included uh, near the top Sinclair Lewis and uh, the uh, novel Arrowsmith. My hero in Arrowsmith was not Martin Arrowsmith. It was Gottlieb. And those of you who know that book uh, real, uh, recognize the pure soul of the scientist who works to make great discoveries and has little heed for his own uh, concerns or reputation and is admired only by an elite group of other scientists able to understand what it is accomplishing. I said, gee, that's what I want to develop. <laughs> that doesn't have anything to do with literature. It has everything to do with science. So I would very much like to think that uh, there are scientists, Rebecca, who are moving in to uh, uh, jostle you to one side, at least to make you share the stage, who uh, will uh, make uh, heroes of the science, scientific impulse. You know, it's, it's interesting. The world of science writing, I think, is it's such an, it's an incredible community. There aren't that many of us out there, I think. And one of the things that's been incredible with my book sort of going out to the world and being embraced and you know, hitting the New York Times bestseller list, there have been, there's so many science writers out there who recognized as I was working on this story that this was, a, this was an important story to get out there. And there are so many science writers out there who helped to spread the word about the book when I, when I was working on it. You know, they're posting on Twitter and Facebook and they're pushing everybody they know, you got to read this story. And there's this sense of community ownership of science writing, I think, as a whole. And one of the things that's been amazing is to watch other science writers see the, the success of science books. Your book, my book, this, when the word got out that this award had gone to two science writers, the whole science writing community was like, yay, we made it. Yeah. And they really have this sense of ownership. And they're, they watch our books and us up on the stage, and I want to sort of like look in the camera and be like, guys, it's E.O. Wilson, we're up here, we did it. Um, because you know, there, is this, there is this lineage that feels like we, are, we actually are all working together to do something, science writers, and, and there, are, there are so many incredible ones out there. I mean, you know, I'm sitting next to one of them, there's some of my heroes. I mean, one of my, I think one of my heroes of science writing who's often under-recognized is Randy Schiltz, who wrote mm -hmm. And the Band Played On, which right. was an incredibly important narrative about the AIDS epidemic when it first began. And you know, I think one of the important things about all of the, the people who have been my heroes in science writing is that they've used storytelling to get important information about science out to the public. Science, uh, people were fighting a lot about science these days. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's kind of interesting that um, so much great science writing um, is emerging now. Um, so why are people, so many pitch battles about continuing, about evolution, about global warming, they're just fighting more and more. Why, why are we still fighting these battles? Uh, you mean why are we fighting specifically about the acceptance of the science? Yeah. Ignorance and lack of common sense? <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I better add to that and to reinforce <laughs> Rebecca's point that um, as, as I think most people here probably would agree, uh, there is a sh serious shortfall of good science education mm -hmm. in our school and in our interest, you know, uh, and in the interest of the American public in science, uh, we've cast, put forth, I'm afraid, the wrong image. And so it's therefore critical as part of the educational process to create science literature that uh, is compelling and that people read. And that's one of the reasons why I wrote a novel, because finally I discovered that people respect nonfiction, but they read novels. They want, <laughs> that's right. they want a story. Right. And I'll just conclude right. this little disquisition by saying that it's time to realize that scientists are not really different from um, a liter uh, literary creative literary uh, mm -hmm. writers. <clears throat> uh, it's just that they tend to be, they tend to have pedestrian personalities. <laughs> and, uh, and He said it, I didn't say it. Oh yeah, well, <laughs> it's true. Uh, and here is the real similarity and the difference between scientists and, uh, you know, and, and, and writers in the creative arts, mm -hmm. if I might include science in the creative arts. The ideal scientist thinks like a poet mm -hmm. and works like a bookkeeper. <laughs> and when you write a report in science, right, Rebecca? Mm -hmm. You better sound like a bookkeeper and let others say, wow, what a great result that was. And since he is writing in such a dead pan technical voice, he must have done the work right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think. <laughs> There's essentially one of the things that my book is very much about is about the importance of scientists being able to communicate science to the general public and essentially what can go wrong when that fails. Mm -hmm. And for this one particular family, for Henrietta's family, it really destroyed their lives. And the, the, a, no scientist for decades was able to just say, here's what a cell is. This is why your mother's cells are still alive. Um, they took them without asking. They, like, they just were never able to communicate with his family. And one of my goals in telling the story was to show that that wasn't malicious. It wasn't like the scientists were sort of, ha ha, we're going to keep something from, from this family. They really, scientists are not trained necessarily to communicate science to the general public. They're trained to communicate it to each other. And so, and I think we're actually seeing a shift in the world of science right now where the younger generation of scientists is actually learning very different things about the importance of communication. And you know, it used to be that if you were a scientist and you wrote a book that the general public could read that went out and was very successful, that was sort of frowned upon by scientists because it wasn't academic. It wasn't scientific. And in order to be accessible to the public, you have to leave things out. You know, scientists, science is a lot about qualifying things. Nothing is ever definitive in science. So when you read scientific papers, it's like this, well, of course, in case that, and well, then maybe this, and it, you know, and, and you lose the public very quickly. And of course, science papers, scientists are not always focused on the human side of the stories. They're looking at the science behind them. And, um, I think the world of blogging, you know, science blogging is huge right now. It's really exploded and I think what you're seeing more and more now is younger generations of scientists that are going online and they're writing, they're writing about science for the general public and they're writing about their own science and initially there was a lot of fighting about that and should they be doing it? There are a lot of <laughs> bloggers out there who write under fake names because it's frowned upon in, their, in academia. But I think a lot of what's happening is that's actually helping to get right. understanding of science out there. In some cases, it helps to actually fan arguments like about you mm -hmm. know evolution. So I think back to your question, I, I think one of the reasons we're still fighting it about these things is because we're human. It's the same reason we have wars. You know, I mean, it comes down to religion versus science often. And yeah. I think science and religion, in a lot of ways, have never been very good at figuring right. out the ways in which they can actually get along. Um, right. And I think you know in 
one of the things that I write about in, in my book is this, the, the family of Henrietta Lacks were deeply religious. They very much believed her soul is alive in these cells and that she was chosen as an angel and brought back to life to take care of people. You know, and the scientists, look, I often go to give talks and they will you know, answer, raise their hands and say, so were you ever able to straighten the family out on that whole her soul's alive in there thing? Um, you know, and then I say to them, well, can you prove to me that her soul isn't alive in there? And, and, you know, and really, what does it matter if the family feels like her soul's alive in there? And then they get very annoyed with me for that. And, um, but, but I think it's an important thing to really look at you know, what, what it means to have your cells growing or what it means to, you know, for various things to be happening in science really depends on your definition of life and death and, and a soul. And I think really for scientists, I think on both sides kind of there's a need for coming together to understand where everybody's coming from because right now it's very much about how they don't get along. And one thing I learned in the process of writing this book was the ways that they can actually get along. And for the family, their religious beliefs really helped them open up to the science and learn it, about it in a way they wouldn't have otherwise. Um, uh, so, Vision, I'm sure many of you have questions. So, um, and someone has a microphone to kind of, but you could also just shout out and we can repeat them. Oh. We're actually, so we are videotaping this, so raise your hand and I'll come to you with the microphone. Thank you. <laughs> I'm uh, amazed at the, or um, deep gratitude at the event that's bringing together science and humanities. And my question is, do you think that the Chicago Humanities Festival is in some measure continuing or contributing to the two culture divide by continuing to call itself the Humanities Festival <laughs> rather than the Science and Humanities Festival? I don't, I don't have to get that repeated. I, I have hearing aids I can hear, but I'm getting a little... Yeah. Would you repeat um, so that? So the, the question was whether, you know, this is the Humanities Festival, and his question was essentially, is that contributing to the, the continued divide between the humanities and science to call it something like the Humanities Festival rather than the Science and Humanities Festival? Am I right? Yeah. Is that, um, well, actually, uh, the three great branches of learning are the natural sciences, the social sciences, and the humanities, and I think they're rapidly converging. Um, as science, uh, the, um, the, the there's the, so, the the famous fault between the fault line, mm -hmm. the Mr. Snow, C. P. Snow, um, stressed famously in his 1959 lecture, right. um, is not a fault line. It's not a divide that you know that we will never really be able to cross. But it turns out due to the effort of people on both sides, primarily the social sciences and natural sciences, but now increasingly in the humanities, uh, it is a borderland uh, that of uh, little explored subjects having to do primarily with the origin of the mind and how the mind works, which is increasingly open to understanding using scientific methods at the same time that from the social sciences and the humanities uh, fields like social um, anthropology, um, cognitive psychology, and some of the more, uh, how should I say it, analytic attempts at literary criticism are approaching from the other side. And connections are being made and they're anastomosing so that it is actually possible now to, to track cause and effect explanations coming out, say, of brain science, and then knowing, having that conciliate, consistent, that amount of brain science consistent with what we know about the rest of biology, and actually tracking out to explanations being fashioned by, uh, for example, archaeologists, anthropologists, uh, cognitive scientists, and so on, in a meaningful way, meaning a web work of cause and expect explanation. So this is what's happening. This is the major thrust that's occurring. And that is basically scholarship. 
So where does literature come into this? Well, literature, aside from doing analytic studies of, uh, you know, li in literary criticism, based on a deeper knowledge of human evolution and, and, and human nature, uh, it comes in the creative exposition of just what is happening in that bridge work of explanations that's now beginning to connect the great branches of learning. <laughs> what he said, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I've been spending a lot of time, my, my, my book's being adopted by a lot of universities in their freshman, first year experience programs, which I think are, are pretty new. Um, and they're getting, they're happening more and more at different schools. And what I hear over and over again from in, instructors in all the different programs, from the students in all the different programs, is that so much of what they're looking for are, you know, stories that show how it's all connected. You know, and so here they have a program where no matter what your major is, everybody reads the same books, they all talk about it in all their classes, mm -hmm. and they look for the connections. And I think that's happening more and more at, in, in, at universities, and I think it's part of this, this shift, is looking at the ways all these things come together, and, and how they're all very similar. I mean, you mentioned that science and writing and literature is actually not that different. I mean, the brain of a scientist and the brain of a writer, I mean, we do the same thing in a lot of ways. It's all about creative thinking, really putting yourself out there and I mean, what's, what's possible and imagining things and then going out and trying to find facts, trying to find things that actually sort of help you develop that further or maybe take you in a different direction. And so I think the creative arts and sciences aren't actually that different. And, um, and I just be, I mean, I've been, I've been traveling nonstop, talking at different universities almost every day for the last 10 months. And that's what I hear over and over again from people in both the humanities and the sciences. So I, it, it is, I think, a bigger, a bigger cultural shift. A question? <clears throat> Um, I'm a kindergarten teacher, and I, I read a lot of nonfiction books to my students, and they love it. However, and I know I'm not alone, I'm nervous about teaching science, so and, uh, many teachers are. What advice do you have to teachers? What image do you want children to have of science and of scientists? Because right now it's a geeky guy in a white lab coat with a pocket protector, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what? absolutely. You know, it's funny. I, I've been, as I've been going out and talking about the book, it's being read by a lot of high school students and some middle grade, um, but it's a little advanced for the younger students. And part of what's been happening is young kids, you know, the high school kids are getting really into, I think they're getting initially just attracted by the sort of sci-fi elements of this story. You know, this woman cells living on all these years and they're growing like the blob. And, but then, <laughs> you know, they, they start to get into the story and, and they're bring, they come to events and they bring their siblings, you know, like they're younger kids and a lot of them are like, I want to read the book too. I'm actually working on a young, young version of it because of that. And one of the, a student came up to me recently at an event, a young girl, I think she was like nine maybe, and um, she was so excited and she came running up to me and this is probably the be best compliment I've ever gotten. She's like, you're not a geek. I thought all scientists had to be geeks. <laughs> <laughs> And she's like, you're like, you know, you're normal and you've got cool boots on. And she was like really kind of shocked that, that I was a regular, not just a regular person, but she could kind of imagine herself being like me someday. And, and I honestly think that, like, find, there are so many people like that. There are so many cool scientists out there. And, you know, yes, the pocket protector thing, and, you know, it, it exists. And, and I, I secretly have pocket protectors, you know, I just leave them at home. <laughs> But I, I do think getting, having role models out there and showing them stories, I mean, go, if you go online, there are so many interesting people out there doing science who are great role models. There's a woman on, on uh, she has a Facebook page and Twitter, she calls herself the ch science cheerleader. <laughs> and she really has been doing a lot to get young women to see that science is actually cool. I mean, she, you know, and they're, they're, so there are actually, I think there are a lot of people out there and I think you can find a lot of them online and you know, just kind of exposing them to those stories um, and letting people who are out there in the sciences, you know, you can find YouTube videos, you can bring them into the classroom in so many different ways just to expose them to the range of people who are out there doing science. I think that's important. Um, and just the stories, you know, stories in science are actually really fascinating and where you lose them is when you just focus on the actual nuts and bolts of the science. Um, and getting people to come in, you know, go find some young scientists in whatever area you are in geographically, bring them into the classroom, let them be all excited in front of the kids, and it really does a lot. Mm -hmm. well, I'll just kind of add to that that <laughs> it's very important that people understand that science is not some kind of um, esoteric, somewhat monastic 
branch of activity. <laughs> but rather, science is what we know, scientific knowledge is what we know with a reasonable uh, degree of certainty, as much as I experience allowed, of how the real world works. It's our common knowledge of what is really in the world and what's happening and where we came from and what we are and where we might be going. And people should feel a proprietary interest in that. They own that knowledge. They should be part of the ownership of that knowledge. In the sense that they have a proprietary stake in it. And so when a child comes along, <clears throat> it's really very important not only to show them that wonderful things have been disclosed, like extrasolar planets, that might be Goldilocks planets, that might be reached in five years by robots in a spaceship. That's all true. But besides that, uh, they should be uh, persuaded that most of the world, the real world, is still unknown. I'll mention in passing, because I was there today, the Field Museum as a wonderful place to go. It gives you that sign, <laughs> that, that sense of immediacy, of experience that you can have when you develop an interest in science. Oh, yeah. In this case, exploring the world. Most of the living world is unexplored. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. And so Absolutely. techniques are being developed at the Field Museum besides their exhibitions on showing how scientists can explore the world. And they're putting it in a form that allows kids to feel that they can go exploring. And there's just a sense of wonder in science yeah. and really bringing that out for kids. You know, I, as I said, I grew up in Springfield. And I think there's a lot of me and the, the person who got into this book and explored this book who like was really came about at the Magic House in St. Louis. And if any of you have been there, it you know, this big old house that they turned into this museum and I that was my thing. My dad would take me there. This was like, you know, what do you want to this is the treat that when I that I got to do whenever we left you know, town. We go to the Magic House and they it was the, you know, mazes and it was incredible and it was all about science. And you know, it was one of my favorite pictures of me as a kid is with my hand on the static ball and my hair standing straight on end. And, um, <laughs> And it was, it is, an, it is an absolutely magical, amazing place. And those exist in almost every city, you know. And and I think we getting the fun part of science in there for kids is so important. I want to dispel a misconception to grab this opportunity that scientists, successful scientists, are uh, unusually brilliant people. You know that they're in sort of a class. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to give you the IQs of uh, three well-known scientists to show you. Um, <clears throat> James Watson, my friend, co-discoverer of, of DNA, IQ 121. Uh, Feynman, the great physicist, uh, innovator, 122. Yours truly, a towering 123. <laughs> what, what does this tell us? Well, one thing you should ask is, well, what about all those people we hear about that are 160, 170? My goodness, aren't they just blowing away the fields of science and so on? What do they do? I'll tell you what they do. They join Mensa societies and work for the Internal Revenue Service. <laughs> <laughs> You know, <laughs> su successful science is yeah. done by hard work and entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And creative thinking. Well, that's yeah. what I'm talking yeah, about. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. In Can other I words, <laughs> uh, I have a rule of how to be a successful, use mathematics successfully since I'm not very gifted at math. And that is, it's a rule uh, that for every uh, important problem in science not yet solved or area of science not yet entered, there is a level of science uh, a low enough uh, required uh, that so any ambitious entrepreneurship of the mathematics, I mean, uh, any uh, competent entrepreneur going into science uh, can do the necessary math. You can let, uh, after you've opened the field up, then you can let the more gifted mathematicians develop it. 
Um, but the point is that uh, it is entrepreneurship. And when I advise, uh, that's extremely important, and the ability to work hard and have grit and take attention on a goal that you want to reach. Uh, and um, so I, I tell, I've been telling graduate students at Harvard for years and years when they were trying to pick a problem to work on, I said, you know, the uh, rule in the military is if you are lost or your, your squad or whatever is lost, march to the sound of the guns, right? Yeah, that, that's it. If you're in science, if you're a young scientist, march away from the sound of the guns. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, like, yeah. I certainly have never gotten my IQ tested, but what? I failed basic biology. And I, I actually was a really didn't, I failed like most of my schooling as a kid oh, up yeah. until the moment that I really found biology in a community college classroom. And, and so for me, the, the, the wonder part of it and the curiosity, that's actually probably, I don't think I ever would have graduated from high school if I hadn't really gotten hooked on the science part of it and had these questions come up that like, well, why and what? And mm -hmm. that's really what got me as a student. And it happened pretty late. Uh, question, uh, why don't you turn your attention to younger people, people in grammar school, etc., in terms of writing science books? I can remember, although I'm certainly not a scientist, my fascination with a book written many years ago called Microbe Hunters by Paul de Kroof, in which it told the story of great scientists and their successes. And it appealed to a, a child's, and was right. old enough to, to understand and read, but it appeals to a child's imagination and turned him into a world with which he had no familiarity instead of waiting until right. high school or Yeah, that's or actually, I, I start, just mentioned, start yeah. Yeah, I'm actually, that's, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm, I'm writing a children's version of the book that I've written, and that, that was inspired by going out and talking to kids and, and hearing them say, like, this story sounds really cool, and basically, I get, that one's too advanced for me. Um, and so I'm actually working with a, a co-author who's, who's written a bunch of novels for kids and is also a scientist, and we're sort of pulling these things together and writing some stuff for kids. And there are a lot of science writers that do that now. They do an adult version, and then they do a kid's version for exactly that reason. Question. Yes, given that the current political climate is so antithetical to science, it appears to me, um, how important do you both think that political activism is among scientists today? Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's, it's very important. I, uh, I just don't know how to put that in quantitative terms. Or, but um, it's, uh, it used to be thought among scientists that if you got active in any political part or you know, trying to reach the public, that you were departing from the brotherhood and the sisterhood. And now we don't feel that way. I got active in um, conservation, global conservation in the early 70s. <clears throat> and when I realized that um, there's a certain point at which scientists, if they see a prob problem that's not widely perceived, and they're pretty sure of it, they better speak up. I mean, after all, if an astronomer is tracking the trajectory of a 10 kilometer wide meteorite and gives it in his calculations an 80% probability that it will strike Chicago, <laughs> then <clears throat> he's really obliged to do more than publishing that as a note in the Proceedings of the, <laughs> National, <laughs> of the National Academy of Sciences and hope that perhaps a congressional staffer will pick up on that and take it on into <laughs> the uh, uh, into the senator's office. Yeah, and I, th I think it is absolutely important. And I think part of it is because, I mean, science is so much about, I and mean, politics is so much about science right now. I mean, any, all the, the late, you know, many recent elections have been, you know, science is always a focal point in the elections. And it's, you know, this is what we will fund, this is what we won't fund. And I mean, the future <coughs> of science yeah. really does depend on these, on a lot of political discussions. And, and a lot of that, you know, people don't, there isn't a lot of talk about what that science actually is. So this, you get these, these big 
important mm -hmm. fields of science that get caught up in, in elections without anybody out there explaining what that science actually is. Um, when, I don't know, what year was this? The, um, I guess this was Bush and um, Gore election. I was in, um, I was sent by the New York Times Magazine to write about a story in Ohio and West Virginia, which are right next to each other, big swing states and that. And I was supposed to be writing about um, basically food. It was a special issue on food and how people's eating habits you know, varied in red states and blue states. Um, and what I ended up finding was that I spent all this time in these two states talking to people, and I was talking to them about politics, and they, and they said over and over again, I couldn't possibly vote for Gore because he's in favor of chopping up babies and injecting them into people. And that was my reaction. And, and they were talking about stem cell research. And how stem cell research became chopping up babies and injecting them into people, that's what it happens all the time. And it, a lot of it is just that there's not a lot of, there's not, there ha aren't a lot of scientists out there talking you know, in, as part of the political discussion. So there's so much misinformation out there about, you know, of course, people will have different opinions about stem cell research. But that's often based on a lack of knowledge. There's such an enormous science illiteracy problem in this country. And I think it is actually part of scientists' you know, duty, and it's in their best interest to get out there and really help educate people, um, particularly when it comes to some of those really hot button issues. Now, speaking of Gore, um, <laughs> did, did, you teach, hmm? did you teach Al Gore? <laughs> no, I wasn't, he wasn't in my class. He wasn't in your class. <laughs> I, so I he, think he would have done so much better had he been. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you mean do you mean with the election or with science? <laughs> Both, maybe. Uh, yeah, I think all along the line. <laughs> okay, one more question, right? Or, Thank you. Uh, could you comment on uh, creationism? Uh, the fact that there are school boards that want to put creationism in the schools, as opposed to uh, the you know the science of uh, evolution and so forth. Could you comment on how, what kind of education is needed uh, so people can resolve these issues? And there are people who are very religious who do take literally uh, what the Bible <laughs> says. So how do you resolve this in view of what education should be? Thank you. I'll take that. Yeah, you can take that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what you're dealing with here, <clears throat> as what we're dealing with so many times when factionalism and politics uh, seem uh, irrational and based on ignorance, what we're dealing here is, with is tribalism and a peculiar type of tribalism in which beliefs that are considered sacred are central to the identity of the in individual belonging to the tribe. And this is a perfect uh, case of where we can bring science, natural sciences, you know, cognitive science, the history of humanity and what really drove the evolution of humanity. A lot of it was tribalism and group versus group in what's called group selection, connected up uh, with uh, what's happening today. And I'll give you an interpretation of what it's all about, creationism. When uh, the interior was, of America was settled. It was settled substantially and not too long ago by uh, pioneer families that moved down across what was at first the real frontier uh, to the where, to the, all the way to the Middle West. And when they got there and they continued on across, they were scattered through farm homesteads and small villages, uh, which at most was a you know, a, a store, uh, a church, and whatever. They left behind them the great cathedrals, the hierarchical religious structures, the theologians, mm -hmm. the certainty of life that it, their forebears had enjoyed within a religious context for centuries. They had none of that. What they did have when they met in order to have community solidarity, which is crucial, to belong to a group, to have a central belief, uh, to be joined uh, solidly because they had to use whatever method they, they had at their disposal 
to uh, develop a personal identity belonging to a group. Group, uh, uh, belonging to a group is one of the most powerful instincts in humanity. So in order to do that, they had to turn to two developments well known in American history. The first was to have an absolute rule that they could all agree on, and that's the literal word of sacred scripture, the Holy Bible. And the other one was uh, the, um, uh, the renewal movement of the early 1800s that swept through the Middle West, West which led to evangelicalism and the sense in Christian thinking that uh, if you gave yourself to the spirit of a group and you called it Jesus, you know, you mm -hmm. surrender yourself to Jesus as your friend and the community with absolute faith in that one thing they could all agree on. They had no time to argue about theology. They had no bishops, so on. Then you would find your identity. And this group of Americans were one of the most successful uh, peoples in history because they were opening up a new land. You can't expect them to overthrow uh, that deep tradition because they do not wish to lose their identity. Yeah, I think the fact that we're talking about these things it is just sort of goes back to our original point about how important science writing is and telling stories about science. And I mean, obviously, I don't think either one of us, ha if one, either one of us had the answer to the question of sort of how to deal with creationism versus evolution, and especially in the schools. Well, <laughs> he may win the Nobel Prize for that. <laughs> but I don't know that that was a solution okay. well, for what yeah. to do. Um, you know, and I do think that um, understanding where it comes from, you know, is really important. And, you know, you people have been fighting wars over these questions forever, and they will. We will never, no, we will, there will not be an agreement on this ever. And, you know, I as a science person, I find, you know, the bringing the, create, you know, the move to bring creationism into the classroom in the context of science to be pretty scary in a sense. And I think that, I think it's, it, it's important that the science remain. And, and I think that teaching the, you know, increasing science literacy and showing, teaching the lessons of science that are behind evolution and getting that, keeping that as part of the curriculums is so important. And then having discussions in the classroom that are frank, saying, okay, some people believe this, some people believe that. Let's talk about this. And really, you know, so much of it is about who's right, who's right, who's right. We're never going to, that's never going to, nobody's ever going to agree on that. So finding the way, the places where we can get science you know, people can still learn science in the midst of um, their own religious beliefs, I think is really important. Um, so I think it's very important to find the places where those two can talk. I don't like to disagree with you, Rebecca. You can. Okay. But I think it will be resolved. Give it two or three generations. Maybe, right. Maybe. No, it will. <laughs> Maybe I'm very short-sighted. Uh, yeah. We're going to have to just evolve into a, a different uh, form of uh, sense of community, of, mm -hmm. of uh, what we can connect to. I actually had success in dealing with evangelical uh, with my book, The Creation, mm -hmm. which I said, let's put it aside, that issue aside for a moment. I respect right. your belief. I don't agree with it. I'm totally different. But let's put it aside. Because we have a supernal issue, uh, you know, an overriding higher issue that only scientists and people in religion can achieve because circumstances are such that uh, they are the most powerful forces in the world, those two, uh, that we have to face that. If we can work together to save the creation, and I wrote a book by that title, <laughs> and not argue about where it came from, right. uh, we would have achieved an enormous uh, goal, right. oh, noble goal for humanity. And I definitely and believe that it's, works. yeah, absolutely. That actually works. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, and I agree. Yeah, and I guess my, what, I, what I meant when I said we're never going to agree was actually we're about the, that part. Like the, yeah. what I, was, I think we're saying the same thing, which is we have to put aside the fact that there are some core beliefs, you know, that, that yeah. we're, you know, there is never going to be universal agreement uh, about where life's, you know, where this all started and about whether evolution exists. But you can put aside certain things and, and have productive conversations step and, step. and yeah. step by step get over where we are now. Nice. I absolutely have enormous hope 
<laughs> maybe too much, that this, the debate and the fighting that we've been having about creationism in, in the schools and what you do about evolution versus creationism, I definitely believe we're going to get to a place where that will not be so central. And we will, be, we will find a way to move beyond that. Um, and I agree no, that it's agree. going to involve having to put some core beliefs Well, we inside. need more writers like you, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and you. <laughs> we actually, this, this program actually runs until 3.30. We have another 20 minutes. Oh, great. Oh, so yeah. don't, oh, good. don't um, leave. So the question. We've got a question up here. The question I have actually two questions. Uh, first for Mr. Wilson, and I'm obviously not a scientist. Is the middle section of your book about the anthill, uh, is that really how it operates? And then for Ms. Sklut, <coughs> where did you find the patience <laughs> to deal with Mrs. Lax's um, relatives, um, how, how did you hang in there? I, I found that remarkable. The first part was for you, whether the center part about the ants Ant. is really the way it is. So yeah. was it factually well, so how, accurate? How the ants mm -hmm. really? I got it. And, the and then the second part was for me. OK, I'll answer So you can ignore first. that. That's okay. Yes, it is literally Let's, true. It's all fact-based. So maybe explain uh, to the, um, everyone. Yeah, the, actually, the part, central part of the uh, book, The Ant Hill, Ant Hill is um, an epic of uh, ant wars, military parades, uh, fights to succeed the dead queen, all of this. It's Homeric. Yes. Uh, and uh, <laughs> it's what uh, got the uh, New Yorker to write an excerpt, uh, yeah. in an excerpt of it. And every part of it is fact-based. I know, because I spent my lifetime working on it. So the ants communicate in pheromones as exactly as I've described it. They have caste, they have wars, all that is true. And uh, we've just signed up, uh, I have, uh, to have an animated movie and we're gonna be, of this, and we're going to be sure, <laughs> uh, we're gonna be sure that when this is done, <laughs> and there are ways of showing how they communicate by smell and taste with English, uh, with subtitles. Yeah. Uh, and you uh, rest assured uh, that when you, uh, you take your kid or your friend to see this movie, you're going to say there's not one iota of uh, Woody Allen in it, and that uh, that is exactly, or close to exactly, as what's actually happening at your feet in the dirt. <laughs> And, and then the question for me was, how did I uh, have the patience to deal with the Lax families? Um, yeah. And how did I sort of see it through for, I worked on this book for, I'm now going on 13 years. I sort of consider myself to still be working on it because I'm traveling and talking about it all the time. Um, but the actual writing process was about 10 years. And you know, when I came along in the late 90s to start writing this book, the Lax family had, I was one in a long stream of people who'd been coming to them for decades, wanting something from them having to do with these cells, and it had never gone very well for them. So, you know, initially the cells were taken without Henrietta's permission. She had no idea that the cells even grew. Her family didn't know until 25 years after she died. You know, at this point, this, her cells were all over the world, you know, in to like the billions and billions of them. and. They had done incredible things for science. They'd also become the first cells ever commercialized. So they were a bit, they, they launched an enormous industry. Her family is, to this day is very poor and they couldn't afford health insurance. And they would often say, you know, if our mother's cells were so important to science, why can't we go to the doctor? And, you know, if people are buying and selling these things, essentially, where's our cut? Why aren't we somehow getting something out of this? And, you know, between the time that they found out about the cell's existence in the 70s, which they did because scientists wanted to do research on her children to learn more about the cells, which they did without consent. Mm -hmm. So the family was then used in research without their consent for many years. And the repercussions of that were enormous. They were, it, it caused so many problems for the family. At various points, you know, their medical records were released and published without their permission. They had, you know, con artists coming along trying to steal their cells. I mean, the number of things that had happened to this family by the time I very naively, at 20-something years old, called them saying, I want to write a book about your mother. <laughs> it, it was un, unimaginable. It really, it, if I had written this as fiction, people would have just been like, 
that's ridiculous. It's just too, it's too almost unbelievable to be true, but it's true. And so when I came along, they had no interest in talking to me. It took about a year and a half to even convince them to talk to me at all. And then our relationship and what followed was this back and forth where particularly Deborah Lax, her, Henrietta's daughter, who becomes really a central character in the book, she would trust me for a little while. And part of how I won her trust was really just by sharing information with her and saying, you know, you can come with me when I do my research. I'll tell you what I learn about your mother's cells. Because her family still didn't know anything about them when I, when I came along. And so she would trust me for a little while, and then she would panic. I would do some little thing that was just like once I reached for her mother's medical records on a table, and she went, she literally like grabbed them, threw me against a wall, really panicked. And she, uh, you know, and this was part of what happened to her as a result of what happened with these cells. And the, she would push me away, and then she would very soon come back and say, okay, I'm sorry, that's part of the way I dealt with that. And what kept me going was her ability to bounce back from those moments. So she, would, she trusted me. She, it, she was so hungry to learn. I'd never met anybody who wanted to learn as badly as she did. She would carry a dictionary around with her, look up basic words. Um, she, just, she had no education. Um, and she, she, her desire to learn was greater than her fear of anything that might happen to her. So she would have these moments where she'd panic and she wouldn't trust me. And she'd come back very quickly and say, OK, I'm sorry. I know this is part of the story of what happened to me as a result of these cells. We need to keep going. I'm, I, need, I need to know what happened. I, I need us to keep going. And so in, in an amazing way, she was my greatest obstacle and my, the thing that kept me going. Because I always knew she was going to come back and rebound from those moments. And it was really inspiring to see someone wanting to learn so badly. Um, and I also really understood why she didn't trust me. I felt it was completely ground. I mean, she had every right to not trust me, what she'd been through. And, and I think I also had my own experiences that helped me sympathize with her in a sense. You know, my, Liz mentioned my dad and that he had, was part of the time when I first learned about the cells. He was sick and had been um, being treated in the hospital. He was also, he had volunteered for a research study. And I drove him to the hospital multiple times a week sometimes for these infusions of drugs. We didn't know if they were going to help or were they going to kill him. And it was, it was a very scary time. And I, I really grew up in research, both in terms of my interest in science, but then also like it was being done to my father. And so I really can, I understood where some of the fear and experience came from, even though obviously my dad did it voluntarily, you know, there was still a lot of fear there. And so I think all of those things really helped me to put her reactions into context and keep going. And also just the more I learned about the story, the more I was like, I have to get this story out there. This is such an important story. And um, the other thing that really helped was I would talk about it. You know, I would meet people, you know, go to dinner parties, whatever. They would say, you know, oh, what do you do? I'm a writer. What are you working on? And I would tell the story, and the reactions every time were the same. The jaws would just sort of drop, and they would eventually, at some point, someone would say, you know, why are you out of your house? Go home and write the book because, <laughs> like, I want to read it. And and that actually really helped because in the moments where I was just feeling like, oh my God, this is never. I'm never going to finish this. I would be reminded of the fact that I was the only one who was feeling really weighed down by the story, and the rest of the world still didn't even know it. Um, and that really helped keep me going, too. We, we have time for one or two more questions, or? OK. I, I wanted to ask Rebecca what's bringing her back to Chicago, what's motivated her to be here, whether it's a position or a job, and what we can look forward to as <laughs> you're becoming a part of the fabric of this city. Um, um, yeah, so the, what brought me back here, my um, longtime partner, my boyfriend is um, a theater, he's in the theater, he's an actor and a director, um, and he has, he's, he's been, an, and also a fiction writer, um, and he's been out acting in the, for a long time, and you know, obviously Chicago, you're an actor and a director, this is an amazing place to be, and he actually has gone back to school at Northwestern, he's in their MFA program for directing. Um, and is just in love with it. <laughs> um, so that's actually what brought us here. And, but we actually had planned to come here either way. He, that was his dream. It was like he really wanted to go back to school and do this program at Northwestern. But we were going to come here one way or the other, in part because of the, the theater world here and the arts here. Um, you know, and I, I've lived all over since I was here. I was in New York. I was in you know, Memphis. I was in Chicago. I've sort of been everywhere. And, there's something about this city that really feels like home for me. It's it's a city. It's you know it's got everything you could possibly want in a city. It's got the arts. It's got culture. It's beautiful. It's also a place that's really livable and, and it feels like a small town at the same time. It's very there's a big community here that feels very home like home to me. And um, so that was part of me wanting to come back too. 
Um, and in terms of what you can expect, I don't know, we'll see. Hopefully I'll be able to be here for more than, <laughs> I've been traveling so much lately. And it's, it's funny because it's actually made me want to stay home more. I mean, so now I've been doing all this traveling and stuff and it's like, but, but I want to stay in Chicago now. Um, so I'm working on this young adult version. There's also going to be a movie of the book. Um, Oprah's producing it and I'll be working on that for a while. So yeah, that's, that will be coming as well. So, um, but yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm actually doing another event here in a couple days. So I really hope to be out there doing things in Chicago as part of the community. So <laughs> this will be our last question. And afterwards, there's a book signing in the lobby, so yeah. thank you. Oh, I think we got one more. I think there's one more. Um, oh, there's excuse one me, more one moment. Um, I've been working in community forestry up in Wisconsin for about 10 years, and um, I've come to feel that more than forestry work to help the environment and the ecosystems and so forth, it's more community work. It's more adult education as well as child education. It's more neighbor to neighbor and connecting communities to the land through local activities. Um, as my group is Wisconsin Family Forest, but I know Vermont Family Forest and other such organizations are trying to get at it that way. And I was wondering if you thought community was, you know, um, Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I do. Yeah. Well, I, um, <clears throat> I, um, I think that that's the answer, and so we need a question. So, which is, uh, what is the best way for the average person without getting involved professionally or really going to extremes in, in public engagement? How, how, can, uh, how can I contribute, or how can we do this locally? Uh, I might add, uh, that's the question that was just answered. <laughs> so, uh, but let me just comment too, that you have something very special here in Chicago, and that's the Chicago Wilderness Program. Yes. Could you raise your hand if you could tell me how many know about the Chicago Wilderness Program? Oh, that's great. Okay, I don't need to tell you about it. <laughs> well, but I don't know, a, there were a lot of people it, who didn't well, raise their hands. Well, okay, <laughs> it, it is uh, the program to find little pieces of nature and semi-nature uh, all around Chicago and right into the inner city and uh, that are not being used and can convert them into little mini wildernesses, little tiny reserves. It could be no more than a, you know, like the size of this auditorium or even a little less. And making that a park and a reserve and <laughs> taking kids there, letting the weeds grow on up and come into a succession and uh, done the, uh, turn into woods eventually before they rise and teach them natural history and ecology right on the spot, right where you live. Chicago wilderness, a model for the country. Yeah. And. Okay. All right, Rebecca and Edward Wilson will be able to sign books out in the lobby. And did you want to say oh, no, one more it, yeah. thing? Well, I just, in terms of this community question, I, I've been spending the last year traveling around to other people's communities talking. And one of the things that, I, in all of this time that I've been traveling around, the thing so far that has been, like, I think one of the biggest highlights of all of my events is one that I did here in Chicago at Shy Arts, which is a high right. school on the yeah. south side, right. an arts high school, where they they brought my book into the curriculum and I went and talked to the students. And I think, you know, it's really easy to get in your car and drive across town or just go to go someplace pretty close. And everybody's got an area of specialization. And I really do think that actually going out into, into the communities and taking, you know, a few hours to go and actually talk to kids about whatever it is that you're really passionate about is so important to do. All right, on that inspirational yes. note, <laughs> by Hero. Yay. Thank you.